Welcome to Fridays with the Forester. This is March 29th, 2024. Today's topic is climate-ready woodlands. We thank you for joining us today. For our host of, of our webinar today, my name is Gary Wyatt, Extension Educator in Forestry as part of the Forestry Team in Mankato Regional Office. Lauren Beckus is our Regional Support Staff at Andover, and she's really been supportive of our uh, webinars and uh, also asks the questions of our webinar staff. Today's topic and speaker is Climate Ready Woodlands, and Anna Stockstead is our Extension Educator, part of our forestry team in Extension, and she's going to be presenting this topic. And I'll show this slide again for uh, you to write down her uh, email later. So this is a Zoom. This is a, a Zoom webinar. Uh, so you're not open to chat, but we want you to address your questions in the Q&A. And we do try and keep it to an hour, but uh, sometimes our Zooms go over 10 o'clock. So if they do with questions, we'll continue to go on. And uh, yeah, we'll end whenever we get most of the questions answered. All of our webinars on Fridays with a Forester are recorded on a Z-link, z.umn.edu slash Fridays. So we've been having some questions about that or where the Zoom links are. And Anna, I'm going to stop sharing and you can start sharing your screen. All we right. Also, we also have uh, Emily, Charlie, and uh, Angie as part of our forestry team um, monitoring the chat and monitoring the uh, uh, Q&A as well today. So thanks so much for having me on today. Uh, so my name is Anna Stockstad, Extension Forester with the University of Minnesota Extension. I have, my office is in Cloquet. Um, today I'm at home in Duluth, but I work all across northern Minnesota. And today I'm going to be talking to you about our new Climate Ready Woodlands program, which consists of climate adaptive tree and plant lists that also provide microfauna benefits. So for all those small critters that we care about, such as pollinators, small mammals, birds, etc. So I'm the one here speaking to you today, but this has been a highly collaborative team process. And I really want to thank the rest of the team, Angie Gupta and Emily Dombeck, both of whom are on this call. This has been a great experience working with both of them on this project. I just want to quickly thank them uh, for making this possible. So I'm going to quickly walk you through what you're going to be able to take away from today. First, I'm going to talk about what the climate change projections are for Minnesota and what the implications of that is for Minnesota's forests. I'm going to talk about the different climate adaptation strategies that are available for you to use as woodland stewards. I'll talk about why diversity and microfauna are important in climate adaptation, especially when we frame it around the concept of rewilding. And then I'll talk about how we developed these lists and why that matters. And then finally, I'll point you to how to access those lists for your eco region specifically. So how did we get here and why did we develop these lists in the first place? So the Extension Forestry team gets a lot of questions about what trees to plant, especially in the context of climate change and also especially for smaller acreage landowners and woodland stewards. And people are really passionate about creating habitat for pollinators, other insects, and just wildlife in general in their woodlands. So we heard that need as well. And finally, people don't want to be introducing invasive species from other continents when they plant a new tree species. And so they were looking for advice on species selection that would be climate adaptive and provide all of these diverse benefits. And so from there, we created the Climate Ready Woodlands program, and we launched this on our website last September. And so we're still in the early phases of this program, but um, we developed it last year and launched it last fall. So now I'm quickly going to walk you through the basis of climate change in Minnesota. So why should we care about what trees we should be planting? What is the climate going to be looking like going forward into the future here in the state? And so we know that Minnesota is getting warmer. The state's average temperature has been consistently warming up since the early 1900s. And of course, we have had some very cold winters and some very mild summers, but it's important that we look at a trend over a long period of time. And when we do that, we can see that our climate is consistently getting warmer. And of course, this winter has been very much out of the norm with how warm it's been. But on average, when we look at these average yearly temperatures, we have been warming since the early 1900s. 
And we can see this manifesting with changes in our plant hardiness zones. So last year, the USDA released the new plant hardiness zone map, and we can see that the hardiness zones in Minnesota shifted significantly northward. So you can see zone 3A in the northern part of the state has significantly shrunk in size and shifted northwards. So this is, again, just another manifestation of how our climate is warming up here in Minnesota. The state is also getting more rain. So just like with average temperature, our average precipitation has been steadily increasing since 1900. So Minnesota is getting both warmer and wetter. And we can see these trends, trends changing across the state as time has gone on. So the precipitation isn't um, universal across the state. How that precipitation is coming down is going to differ depending on where you are in the state. But overall, we can see that we aren't consistently getting more precipitation across the entire year. Instead, we're getting less frequent, larger precipitation events. So these really large rainfall events of greater than one inch, which I'm showing here in this figure here. And we definitely saw this last summer, at least here up here in the Northeast Arrowhead, where we got these really large precipitation events. And that can be concerning for several different reasons, whether that's increased erosion, um, which can cause major issues for our forest ecosystems. But it's really important when we're thinking about climate change and our forests in general, is that we think about how species are adapted to extremes. So whether those are extreme temperatures or these extreme precipitation events, those kind of define the boundaries of what a species can tolerate. So when those extremes are changing, this is going to impact whether or not our tree species, wildlife species can tolerate those changes. So we're getting these larger precipitation events, but then those large precipitation events are separated by longer periods of drought, which we have all known have been, has been happening for the last few years during the summer. And this figure specifically is showing the drought in 2020 and 2021, where we experienced rapid drought development. It was the same last year in 2023, um, and I would not be surprised if we had another drought year this summer, especially with the lack of snowfall, at least up until this week, the relatively lack of snowfall um, going forward into the growing season. And on that same note, our winters are getting warmer, so the lengths of our winters um, are decreasing. So minimum temperatures have increased on average since the early 1900s. And so that means that many species, whether that's an invasive species such as emerald ash borer, uh, that may, they may be impacted by cold winters or the lack of cold winters because those really cold temperatures can control the populations of those invasive species. But when our uh, winter temperatures warm, that means that their populations might not be impacted to the same degree. Okay, so anytime we talk about climate projections, it gets really scary really fast and can cause us some real anxiety and that's valid and understandable. But the good news is, is that we can take action as woodland stewards through climate adaptation and mitigation. So I'm gonna walk you through some general concepts when it comes to climate adaptation. And first, I want to define a couple of broad strategies that we can take when thinking about how to respond to climate change. And these are terms that we'll hear a lot in the climate world. So first, mitigation. This means that we can focus on reducing the emissions that we're putting out and stabilizing the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So in forestry, this would look like increasing the capacity of our forests and forest products to sequester and store carbon. Outside of the forestry world, this could look like uh, driving more electric vehicles, taking more public transportation in contrast to driving a car uh, powered by fossil fuels. So trying to reduce our current emissions. On the other side of the coin, adaptation means that we work to adapt to the climate change that is already occurring and will continue to occur. So this could look like planting climate adapted tree species. And both strategies are critically important. They're, the, they're two sides of the same coin. And so a tandem approach is almost always going to be the most successful. So mitigation is really important. But for this presentation and for this program, we're focused in on adaptation. And this is because we have already committed to a certain level of warming. So we need to adapt as well as mitigate to climate change. 
We have already committed to a certain level of climate change because carbon dioxide as a gas hangs out for a very long time in the atmosphere between 300 and 1,000 years. Then the ocean releases stored heat decades after the emission of greenhouse gases between 25 to 50 years. So this means that there is already warming in the pipeline. We can't go back and change that. We've already committed to it. We can't reverse climate change, but we can adapt and improve our, um, our management strategies going forward to make sure that our ecosystems are healthy and resilient in the face of future warming. And so with uh, climate change and the idea of adaptation, Minnesota is really unique because we have four different biomes in Minnesota. And specifically, we have the southern border of the boreal forest, which with climate change is at risk of moving northwards and being replaced by more deciduous hardwood species. And so there's a lot of research being done here in Minnesota to look at how we can adapt um, our forests across the state to climate change and looking at the impacts of climate change on the boreal forest. And so we all care deeply about the boreal forest. We wanna keep it on the landscape. And so we can do that through climate adaptation. We can apply that to all the different ecosystem types in the state as well. And so just again, we need to use our forests not only to mitigate climate change, but we also need to adapt to the climate change that's already occurring and is going to continue to occur. And there are a lot of programs in Minnesota implementing climate adaptation in our forests. And over a third of forested land in Minnesota is privately owned, but public land and land native, uh, managed by native nations are also implementing these adaptation strategies. And ultimately the idea of climate adaptation in the forestry world isn't really that new. We're always thinking 50 years ahead, 100 years ahead. So this idea of adaptive management isn't new. In the DNR, the Forest Service, Native Nations and academics are all implementing and evaluating different strategies of forest climate adaptation. And so from all this amazing work related to forest climate adaptation has come this idea of a climate adaptation spectrum. So we can take several different approaches to managing forests in the face of climate change, and we can categorize these approaches into three different categories. So there are three strategies that we can take, resistance, resilience, and transition. All three of these strategies are valid, and the best approach is one that's going to be in going to be implementing a little bit of each part of the spectrum. And ultimately the route that you choose to take is gonna depend on your own goals for your woodland, what you want your woodland to look like in the future and how you personally connect and care for your forest. But to walk you through each of these and just kind of define what they are. So resistance is when we want to maintain the current conditions. So for example, if we want to create a refugia of eastern white cedar, which may not be doing so well in the future with climate change, we could create a refugia, for example, on a north facing slope where it's cooler, wetter, a little bit more buffered from the impacts of climate change. That could be maybe along the North Shore or in other areas. So we're focusing in on maintaining those current conditions and limiting impacts from climate change. So trying to create a buffer. In this scenario, we also need to think about risk and that applies to all these strategies. Risk is gonna be different for each of these strategies. For a resistance approach, risk is low at first and is going to increase over time because it requires more effort to main current, maintain current conditions as the climate continues to change. Resilience is similar, but this is where we allow some degree of change, but we manage the force so that it is better able to bounce back after disturbances. And so in terms of risk, resilience is the middle ground. Risk is highest in a resilience approach if a disturbance occurs that is too much for that ecosystem to accommodate. So a great example of a resilience approach is reducing the amount of balsam fir in your woodland to reduce the fuel load and therefore the risk of ca catastrophic wildfires in your stand. Or if you live up in the northeast arrowhead, this would also be reducing the impacts of spruce budworm. So resilience focuses in on building up the defenses of uh, that forest ecosystem so it is better able to bounce back after disturbances with a limited amount of change to that ecosystem as a whole. And then finally, transition is where we intentionally facilitate change. So this could include planting climate-adapted tree species that are predicted to do well in the future climate. 
But in this strategy, risk is going to be highest when first starting out because we're planting trees that are better adapted for the future climate, but not necessarily as well adapted for today's climate. And for the purpose of the Climate Ready Woodlands program, we're focused in on the right side of the spectrum towards resilience and transition. But again, this entire spectrum um, is important to be implemented as a whole across the landscape. We need to be trying out strategies from the entire spectrum to make sure that we have healthy, resilient forest ecosystems going forward into the future. And so there are many different pathways that you can take and you could be implementing these strategies in tandem. And so we really recommend working with a natural resource professional to help you work through your goals for your woodland and what you want your woodland to look like in the future. So this will help tease out those different pathways that you could take in terms of implementing climate adaptation strategies in your woodland. And try experimenting with strategies from across the spectrum. Try developing some refugia for a species that you want to keep on the landscape. Maybe try planting a couple of um, new tree species that are well adapted to the future climate. So at the core of this project, and a really important part of climate adaptation is improving resilience. And we can do that by improving the diversity of our forests. And a concept that we've rooted this program in is called rewilding, which I've included the definition here, and you can uh, read that if you'd like. And this is from Carver et al. 2021. But essentially, rewilding is the idea of improving the diversity of forest ecosystems with climate adapted species so that we're creating resilient, self sustaining ecosystems of the future. So, this is slightly different from the idea of ecosystem restoration where we are trying to restore a past ecosystem. Here, we're trying to create an ecosystem more um, suited for a future climate, if that makes sense. But it really drills down onto the concept of creating diversity, not only in our tree species, but also our understory plants and all those microfauna species. Again, those small critters, pollinators, insects, uh, small mammals, birds, bats, et cetera, all those small critters that make up the foundation of our ecosystem. And so when we think about an ecosystem and all the beings in that ecosystem, like a pyramid, we can see that all of our species of plants and those microfauna make up the base or the foundation of that ecosystem. And just like when we're building a house, we need to have a strong foundation. So when we focus on creating resilience and high biodiversity at the foundation of this ecosystem, we're going to improve the ability of that ecosystem to be strong and productive in the face of climate change because we're creating space for all those little critters and all the diversity of plant species at the foundation of that ecosystem. Okay, so that was a lot of context and a lot of foundation for this project. And now I'm gonna get into how we created these lists and why that's important. So we used two different data sources. First, we used data from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And then we use climate data as well from the U.S. Forest Service Climate Change Tree Atlas tool. And this data is really nicely summarized by the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. So that's a bit of alphabet soup, lots of <laughs> acronyms there. Um, but essentially, we're combining two different climate change models. So it's really important to emphasize here that we are using a model-based approach to create these lists. So we're using the Minnesota DNR and the Forest Service data, combining that to create these lists. So for the DNR data, so what we did is we looked at all the native plant communities in Minnesota, and we documented all the tree species in those native plant communities from across the state. So an example of a native plant community would be FDN32. And so this has uh, different tree species that are documented within it, as well as understory plant species, all of which we documented and compiled for the different um, native plant communities across the state. Then the DNR has tree habitat response to climate change for each of those tree species within that native plant community. And so this is a response to a warmer climate, as well as a response to wetter climate for each of those tree species. We combine that with the tree atlas data, which documents the climate change capability of each of those species um, under a low emission scenario, RCP 4.5, and a high emission scenario, um, RCP 8.5. 
And then the tree atlas also provides a list of species with um, that are predicted to have new habitat with migration potential, and which I'll talk more about in a little bit. So then we combined both of these data sources and we looked at uh, this, each of the species across all of the native plant communities. And we looked at how it was predict predicted to do with climate change. And overall, these species had to have a response of pretty much stable or better um, in going forward into the future climate. And so if that species was looking like it's going to be stable or better going forward into the future, we moved it over onto the final list. And we also documented those wildlife benefits for each of those tree species. So now to give you a little bit more information on the migration potential species. So since our project is a mix of the resilience and transition strategies, we have also included some species that have been modeled to perform well in this region's future climate, but are not necessarily currently present in the area that we're looking at. For example, ecoregion six, um, which is in East Central Minnesota. But all of these species are native to the eastern deciduous forest. So we're only looking to the east of us and to the south of us. We're not thinking of moving any western species into Minnesota. We're only looking um, a little bit south and to the east of us. And so this strategy of moving species um, from a region from their from their native range to a uh, region where they will pretty much be, be a new species. This is called uh, assisted migration or more specifically assisted species migration. And we can have a whole nother talk on assisted migration, but there are different levels within that. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of this presentation. But for this case, we're talking specifically about assisted species migration. And for all of these, we documented whether or not those species have any significant forest health concerns. For example, beech bark disease ruled out American beech from our lists, and as well as any invasive tendencies. So black locust popped up on that migration potential list, but we ruled that out because um, it's on the noxious weed list here in Minnesota. And when we're looking at those migration potential species, actually in the climate change tree atlas, we can see what their um, habitat potential is projected to be like going forward into the future by 2100. And so on the left, you can see the current range of post oak, which is a migration potential species on the list for eco region six in East Central Minnesota. So you can see currently it's to the south of us in Missouri, to the east of us. But under a high emission scenario, so RCP 8.5, we can see that the potential future habitat distribution for post oak is going to expand into northern Minnesota. So this doesn't necessarily mean that post oak will naturally migrate into northern Minnesota, but the future climate and the future habitat in Minnesota is likely to be suitable for post oak. And each of these climate or each of these migration potential species, um, as modeled by Tree Atlas, has different different model reliabilities, um, different abundances, and we're playing around with that data right now and modifying some of my some of our methodology. Um, so definitely stay tuned for updates related to that, which I'll talk more about later on. But since we're using a model based approach, um, there's going to be uncertainty in risk to these lists because we can't necessarily be sure how these species are going to survive in the short or long term or how they're going to interact with the rest of the ecosystem. And so as a result, it's really important that we remember that climate adaptation, the idea that the best approach is one that implements the entire spectrum of resistance, resilience and transition. Because as with anything, we don't want to be putting all of our eggs in one basket. We want to be trying out a few different approaches. And so for those migration potential species, especially since they are on the transition end of that climate adaptation spectrum, they're going to have a higher risk of short-term mortality. Because, for example, if we were to plant post oak, it's currently adapted, um, for example, to climates in Missouri, uh, where it's less clear how it's going to be doing in the short term, though I'm sure it would be doing very well in this year's winter. But those... Um, those impacts of the current climate on some of those migration potential species is where we need more research, more experimentation to see how those species are actually doing right now in Minnesota. And then the long-term survival of any one of those species, whether it's assisted migration species or a species already in Minnesota, 
that long-term survival is really going to be site-specific. And just because a species isn't on one of these lists doesn't mean it's not going to be here in Minnesota and it's not going to be doing well. For example, white pine or eastern white cedar may not be on some of the lists, but it could still be doing very well in northern Minnesota along the North Shore where Lake Superior buffers the impacts of climate change um, in that landscape. And finally, forests are complex dynamic systems with complex feedback loops that we can't even claim to fully understand. And so the research is still working through these feedback loops and the concept of climate adaptation. But since we already know that we have committed to climate change, we need to just try something and see what works because we need to take that climate action to help our forests adapt in the long term to climate change. So it's just important that we are aware of this uncertainty and risk when it comes to some of these migration potential species and just climate adaptation as a whole. Okay, so I talked a lot about the methodology for the trees, both the Minnesota species and the migration potential species, but we also have drafted um, lists of climate resilient microfauna friendly plants in Minnesota. And so we did this in a slightly different way because there's not robust climate data for many of these understory plants. They can be really understudied. And so instead, what we did is we compiled all of the understory plants from all of the forested native plant communities in the state. And then we looked at the current ranges of those understory plants. And if the current range of those plants extends far to the east and to the south of us, we considered it to be climate resilient. So this is different, for example, compared to a boreal species that grows in peat bogs, probably has a pretty limited range to just northern Minnesota. And so that wouldn't be considered climate resilient, according to our methodology. So we documented this proxy climate resilience, and we also documented all those microfauna benefits, whether that's for insects, small mammals, birds, amphibians and reptiles, et cetera, whatever it may be. And then we, act, we eventually expanded that since we realized, wow, a lot of these plants are understudied. We expanded this to look at um, cultural benefits as well as benefits for nutrient cycling, water storage and cycling, et cetera. So a lot of these understory plants play huge roles in the ecosystem, but aren't always necessarily well studied. Okay, so now I have talked you through how we developed the list and why that's important. And now I wanna point you to our website for this program, which is z.umn.edu forward slash climate ready, which you can access here using the QR code. And so we have created tree and plant lists for all 11 eco regions of the state. And so you can go here to find the list for your region specifically and dig into what the recommendations are for your area of the state. But as I touched on earlier, I do want to preface that we are actually in the process of updating and refining our methodology and likely the content of these lists. And so we're coming up with uh, version 2.0, the um, next best version of these lists. So definitely stay tuned for updates, whether that's through our newsletter or you can reach out to us directly, but we are in the process of um, updating these lists. But how do you know if these lists are right for you and they're not intended to be the right fit for everyone or to be the one size fit all of tree and plant recommendation lists? So these lists are right for you if you're interested in improving, in improving the climate resilience of your woodland and if you want to focus in on diversifying the species composition of your woodland, especially with species that are shown to be climate adapted. And then those migration potential species could be right for you if you're interested in being experimental on a small scale to try to improve climate resilience in your woodland. So these migration potential species, these are not intended to plant your large clear cut or on any large scale. These are intended to be planted on a small scale where you can monitor and care for those migration potential species to see how they're performing. So again, for the small scale, not for a large scale, for example, after a harvest. And so these lists, these are just intended to be one option in the very wide spectrum 
of management approaches. And at the end of the day, there is no one right way to manage forests. It's all going to depend on what your goals are for your woodland, what you value, and what you want it to look like in the future. So that's going to help you define the climate adaptation approach or approaches that you take going forward into the future. But anytime we're talking about climate change and climate adaptation, it can feel really scary and maybe we can feel like we're not doing enough. But really, the most important thing that you can do as a woodland steward is to keep your forest as a forest. Land conversion, so the conversion of forest to something that's not a forest, maybe a housing development or a parking lot, whatever it may be, that is where the highest risk of carbon emissions comes from. So the most important thing that you can do as a woodland steward is to keep your forest as a forest. I just want to emphasize that and end this talk with that note, because it can be really overwhelming at times thinking about climate change. And as I mentioned earlier, climate anxiety is a very real thing. So just by having a forest and caring for it, you are doing the right thing. So now I just want to start wrapping up my talk and kind of focus on the key takeaways from today. So we learned that Minnesota's climate is getting warmer, wetter, and experiencing changes in extremes. And we know that a diverse ecosystem is going to be a resilient ecosystem. So when we focus in diversity on the foundation of that ecological pyramid, so in trees, understory plants, and wildlife, we are building a resilient ecosystem. So we created the Climate Ready Woodlands program using a model-based approach, using both DNR and Forest Service climate data. And there are tree and plant lists available for you all as woodland stewards for all 11 eco-regions of the state. And I really encourage you to go check out that web page, poke around and see what you find. And you can reach out to us anytime if you have questions about the, the content of those lists specifically. So then what's next for this project? We have some really exciting things coming down the pike. So first of all, like I said, we're in the process of updating our methodology and creating amazing version 2.0 of these lists. This year, uh, those migration potential trees will be going in the ground at the U of M St. Paul campus. So we're uh, working with the urban forestry lab at the U of M to create experimental plantings where we can monitor the survival and performance of those migration potential species to see how they're doing in the short term in Minnesota's current climate to help fill in um, a bit of that information gaps. And then as always, we're always delivering content across the state. So we're developing and implementing our curriculum for the Climate Ready Woodlands program. And if you're in interested in any one of our team coming and speaking um, to your group or to your community, please let us know. We are really interested in teaching this content across the state this year. And something that's really exciting and that we've been getting um, a lot of questions about is that we are piloting a participatory science project, hopefully starting uh, this summer, where we're going to be asking you as woodland stewards and members of the community to um, report on the presence of those migration potential species already on the landscape and monitor their performance as well as if you are planting any of those migration potential species, you can report on that to us and monitor the performance of those trees that you have planted. Again, to see how those species are doing in Minnesota's current climate, as well as how they're going to do in the future. So if you're interested in that at all, definitely uh, feel free to reach out to us and we can talk more about it. But this will be a pilot stage this year, and hopefully next year we'll be releasing a full participatory science project once we work through the beginning stages of figuring out the participatory science protocols and all of that. All right, and with that, I just want to give another thank you to the rest of the team, Angie Gupta and Emily Dombeck. Like I said in the beginning, this was a highly collaborative team process that wouldn't have been possible without both of them. I'd like to thank Jerry Goodrich uh, with the Climate Impact Corps. Um, he is the one doing all of the um, plant uh understory plant work. So he's compiling all of the climate resilience data, wildlife data for all those understory plants. So I want to quickly thank him, as well as our reviewers on the Extension Forestry team and our partners at the DNR, as well as other natural resource professionals that we have worked with throughout this entire process. And with that, I just want to say thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, we would greatly appreciate if you filled out this survey with your feedback on this content, um, c.umn.edu 
forward slash CRW survey. You can also access this, access it using the QR code here. We would love to hear your feedback so that we can inform and improve this program. And here is our contact info, so you can feel free to reach out to any of us at any time. So thank you all so much for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Wonderful, Anna. Uh, we're going to have Lauren uh, address the questions or ask the questions uh, as, as uh, some of our team, uh, Emily and Charlie and Angie, has been answering some of those questions on online. Okay. Um, first question here, would not there be another wider bottom level of chart soil or showing soil biota? Absolutely. So as a person with a background in forest soils, I totally agree that we are uh, that would be the true foundation of the ecosystem. Um, so if we were to, if, if I were to revise that pyramid, I would totally agree and add in soil biota. And then why not Western species? So the um, U.S. Forest Service Climate Change Tree Atlas tool only considers species from the eastern part of the U.S. Um, and it's important uh, when we're thinking about climate adaptation and assisted migration, that we are trying to match up habitat types. So we are trying to plant trees maybe from a little bit further south in Minnesota, but we're planting it in a similar ecosystem. And so we're going to have an easier time finding similar ecosystems to the east of us. Um, it's a very different landscape, very different climates out west. Um, and so, and like I said, the Climate Change Tree Atlas is only looking at eastern U.S. species. And then you mentioned you were looking for trees that will do okay in warmer wetter climates. Did you look at drought resilience too? Not directly, no, but that is something that we have talked about. Um, looking at drought resilience as also as well as things like um, resistance to deer browse. And so I think those could even be separate lists. And this is these are all things that we have been noodling about and would like to do in the future. And then are oak species interchangeable to insects that love them? That's a really good question. And I actually don't know the answer to that. Angie, you may know that. Do you have an answer to that question? I do. Well, a little bit. So um, great job, Anna. Thanks for pitching it too. I think the tag team is great. So um, I, if you are familiar with Doug Colomay's work, he has done a lot of writing about um, oak trees. This is one of his books. Maybe it's backwards. Um, and in his book, if you look at the references, sometimes it is to species, but often is just to genera. And so it is unclear to me if it, how much the species um, are flexible or, or if it's a data gap, if we don't know the answer. But, but I do get the impression that many, many of our small species are relatively flexible. Um, maybe not always at every stage in their life, right? So even if you think of a monarch, it has to lay its eggs on common milkweed, but then when it goes to feed, it feeds on many different things. And so there's these difference in life stages that I'm also a little unclear about. So the short answer is we're not positive, um, but I, I think there's hope and optimism there though. I think there is those species ranges. When we went and looked at that proxy for um, understory plants, some of the ranges were really enormous, like much larger than I realized. And then when we went and looked at the microfauna data, again, it was it was fascinating how large some of those ranges were. And so I found comfort in that, right? There is There are some really big ranges and there seems to be um, overlap in those uh, different ecosystem niches. And so I think we can lean into that as we think about our future. Okay, and then how have private landowners responded to your work and recommendations? Will they use them? So uh, we have given um, a few, well, I have personally given one presentation up in Grand Marais last year in November. Um, and so far, at least from my experience with the people that I've interacted with, it's been well received um, and people are excited just to have an option available to them, like I've alluded to, you know, climate change is really causes a lot of anxiety and it can sometimes feel like we can't do anything. Um, and so I think people overall are pretty relieved to have an option available to them. Um, and Angie also has done a lot of programming down in her neck of the woods. And maybe you if, want to add to that, Angie, if you have anything different. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I did a program yesterday to uh, a group of woodland owners. And I would say generally, uh, I think 
people have been really accepting and supportive of this work. I think there's a lot of sense of relief that they can indeed make their own decisions and make change and work for a future that um, that gives them a little more hope and agency than the, the absence of information that's preceded it. So I've heard uh, really a lot of enthusiasm for woodland owners, which is comforting. And then have you noticed a long-term change in land cover, especially where prairie borders forest? Are those borders moving on way or another? One way or another, I think is what they meant to say. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I am definitely not an expert on prairies or that part of the state as someone who works in the Northwoods. But I mean, my understanding is that since the climate is getting warmer and wetter, that's not necessarily the best for prairies that prefer more dry conditions. And, and so I would imagine probably some of those hardwood species, the oaks that are going to be moving more no northward, um, oaks and hickories, et cetera, um, could also be expanding more to the west. Angie is much more familiar with prairies, and I keep calling on her, but she is the southern Minnesota. Minnesota Forester as well as Gary. <laughs> but that's my understanding. So okay. And then Minnesota's iconic coniferous, um, white pine, red pine, jack pine, and so on, are all seemingly absent from the list. Do landowner owners be scared to plant those trees, or is there a reason to continue planting them? So to jump to the last part of that question, yes, there's absolutely reason to continue planting them. It all depends on the landowner's goals and the objectives. And so if they care for white pine, red pine, or you know any of the conifers, they can continue planting them. And I think that would be an example of um, more of a resistance strategy. But the absence of those species um, from the list is something that we're looking at um, because some of the modeled data can... Uh, kind of differs depending on which data source you're looking at for some of those conifers. And so that's something that we're looking into, but we definitely don't want to communicate the message that they can't plant those species. Those species still have a lot of value, whether that's, you know, ecological, cultural, economic, whatever it may be. And so people should definitely keep planting them if that fits within their own goals. And then is there any guidance for smaller property owners that may only have one or two acres of wood, wooded property that want to help manage their woodlands for the future state. Yeah, so this project initially started off, um, we were calling it uh, rewilding your backyard woods with the focus on those smaller acreage landowners. So focusing in on, you know, planting a diversity of tree species, but also supporting a diversity of understory plant species. But of course, when you have a smaller acreage property, it's going to be harder to do things like getting timber harvested. A lot of that you're probably going to have to try to do with yourself or with uh, members of your community. Um, but we try through our blog posts um, on the My Minnesota Woods blog, we have posted several different blog posts that are going to be relevant to you as smaller acreage landowners um, focused on building biodiversity. And so if you have more questions about that, yeah, you can definitely reach out to us and we can talk you through that. This one's a little connected to that one. Um, is there a list of climate knowledgeable foresters that can help us with our climate ready plan? That's a great question. I mean, I would say that like any um, any of the foresters that are listed, whether that's on the DNR um, private forest management page or the um, stewardship plan writers or your foresters at your local soil and water conservation district would all be able to help you. Um, like I said earlier, um, you know, forestry is all about thinking, you know, 50 years into the future, 100 years into the future. So I think they're all going to be able to help you with that. Um, and so I would just recommend reaching out to any forester in your area. Um, but we don't necessarily have a list of like climate ready foresters. I think they'd all be qualified to help out. Um, and then this one's a little more specific. We're currently clearing balsam fir on our land that has grown after a shelterwood harvest 30 years ago. Would post oak be a good option to actively plant afterwards versus just letting the red oak, maples, and basswood fill in naturally? 
Um, I would say probably no, because the, you know, the migration potential species aren't intended on a large scale. And so, and then again, this is going to depend on what your goals are. If you'd like some more of those hardwood species, I, and again, this is very site specific. And so I would recommend working with a forester who can actually walk the site with you, but I would recommend focusing in on, um, promoting the health and resilience of the red oaks, basswoods, maples, et cetera, um, making sure they're healthy. And then maybe you can try planting a couple of the post oaks and see how they do in that community. Um, but I would try to promote that native community and then try planting some of those, some post oak to see how it does. But that's not for a large scale. That's just thinking a handful of trees, see how it does. <laughs> and these two questions kind of go together. How can we participate in the citizen studies? And is there any group already formed for woodland owners to share observations, experiences, and ideas going forward? So for the first question, um, I would email us directly um, for how to get involved in the participatory science project. Like I said, this year it is going to be a pilot project with just a handful of participants so we can test out our protocols and work through any issues that may come up and also make sure that our platform for data collection is working. So just know that um, it may be more of um, maybe something that you could get involved in next year. Um, if there's a group already formed um, to share observations, experiences, and ideas, not that I know of, but that's a really good idea. Um, and I think that's something we'll talk about and definitely feel free to follow up with us. And I see Angie unmuted, so maybe she has something to add. I do. I'm excited. So I love the question and I love participatory science. So thanks for asking it. Um, and I think the answer is I'm going to say yes. So Anna absolutely talked about our limited pilot project. And that's really because we have to sort out the data collection app. So that's what's that's what that's our limitation right now. So we're going to pilot that over the summer um, and it's going to be a two prong project. So one is going to be tell us about the or the uh, system migration species already on the landscape. So you don't have to own those. You don't have to plant those. They can be in a park or a yard or whatnot. Um, and then we would like to know health data and some other more detailed things. Um, and then the other part of that component, so it's two pronged, would be if you're willing to plant these species, the new to the region species, then tell us what you planted, how it's doing, health, um, and we would like you to revisit both of those prongs um, over multiple years so we can get a handle on to answering some of these really important questions. But I, I'm going to we were talking about this just this week, so nothing is entirely final, but I think we leaned and decided that we are going to um, ask uh, woodland owners or stewards that already have some of these new to the region species on their land. Um, if you would like to tell us how it's going for you, um, we will set up a platform and it will actually probably be a bit free form, like a Google sheet in which you can tell us what you're doing and we'll have different prompts. I've done this in another participatory science project um, related to jumping worm management and it was a lot of data for us to manage, but it ended up being a really rich data source. So I think that's going to roll out for anyone this spring, but it'll be a learning curve. So offer us some grace. And then I'm willing to just say right now, um, whether we do it as a full participatory science project or not, but if you know you have some of these new to region species in your area, in those new regions, uh, please report them to iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is a huge global database for participatory scientists related to um, conservation. And so anything that ever lived can be included in iNaturalist. So if you have uh, if you have a black walnut on the North Shore, like put it in iNaturalist and that will be really helpful and informative for us. We may also really direct people there, but that is a little less certain, but you can do it anyway. So thanks. Thanks, Anna. Yep. Um, and then this one's maybe a bit more complicated. Are large timber or paper companies considering this issue in their management of vast forest lands that they own? So I can't speak for um, forest industry as a whole, but I know from industrial foresters that I've worked with that, yes, they are considering climate change, um, but I definitely don't want to speak for industry as a whole. I think I saw uh, well, there's one industry forester on the call, but I won't call on him. But I would say, yes, I think they're definitely thinking about climate change. And then our projects like Spruce providing info to help us preserve our boreal pine forest. Has any of their data been part of your projects? Yeah, so we haven't directly incorporated data from Spruce or um, other similar studies, um, but we have def that's definitely part of 
the over, like the resources that we've referred to, um, and I've read a lot of studies out of Spruce, but their data directly is not incorporated into the methodology. And then do we have the link for the trial program? Which link is that, Anna? So we don't currently have a link for the participatory okay. science project. Um, I would recommend you could recommend e emailing us. Um, we don't have a website currently for that, but hopefully that will get up and running sometime soon <laughs> in the near future. <laughs> Can I jump in, Anna, real yes. quick about that? So if um, people want to join our, um, uh, I'm going to like pitch it to Emily now, um, our forestry, Extension Forestry email list, everything will be advertised through there for sure. And so we'll get that link dropped into the chat here as soon as we can pull it up. And then this person says, I've noticed pulp mills reducing their buying is there something else to do with all the balsam fir being removed um so i guess i don't know if i'm fully understanding the question but i mean we have had a change of markets in northern minnesota for pulp markets um, a couple years ago verso and duluth closed down and so that means that um, they're not accepting balsam fir anymore so that means that it's much harder to get balsam off the landscape in northeast um, minnesota which is an issue for uh, spruce budworm mitigation, wildfire mitigation, et cetera. Um, don't know if that answers that question, but there have been some changes in markets for pulp. That sounds about right. Okay. If there's additional questions, um, please put them in the Q&A. Um, next one, are you working with the DNR? They are actively working to remove sustainable maple producers off state land to clear cut nature resilient trees like these. Um, the DNR has been involved with um, reviewing our methodology and helping to create these lists. And we have been in active communications with them about how we can improve the program um, related to your second point. I don't I don't have an answer or response for that, but I would say that we have been collaborating with the DNR. And then have you partnered with indigenous communities such as some of the healthiest forests on the continent are stewarded by them? Yeah, so this is something that we're thinking about a lot. And we've also thought about partnering with um, Native nations, not only in Minnesota, but also to the east and to the south of us for those uh, to, to think about some of the knowledge that they have about caring for those migration potential species. So for example, post oak, among many other species that are native a little bit further south and east of us, but not necessarily here. So thinking about how we can work together with them to think about how we can best care for and steward those species. And then the last two are just a couple of comments. Oh, actually, there's another question here. Can you speak to deer browse resistant species a bit? That's a great question. I'm going to pitch that to Angie because she talks about that a lot. I heard she, that's a big interest of yours. Yeah, deer browse resistant species. It is. Okay. Um, so we are, I think we're going to have a list together. I, it, it, we're not there yet, right? So we we put a lot of energy. We reviewed 270 different individual species. Um, we have way more data behind the scenes than you have available for you because it was pretty overwhelming volumes. Um, but I do think that that is a high demand thing. So I think what you're going to see is we'll try to rank them. Um, eventually, we're not ready yet. So deer resistant species of both overstory and understory by ecoregion, I suspect. Um, but I, I, I think, I think there's a, a many ways that we can think about deer, right? So for many trees, they can resist deer once they get above browse line. So it's really stewarding them to that height level that is going to be super critical. And so I've been really intrigued by some things called slash slash walls. I heard about a slash carpet recently. So using wood from the forest to create structure around the trees until they get established and they get above that browse line. Um, a lot of people will use tree tubes. I've been really fascinated by like small fencing in small groups. Um, and so there's a lot to think about that may or may not be manageable depending upon your size and your scale and your deer, your deer pressure. But um, I definitely think it's worth considering. And I, I strongly suspect we'll be putting out more resources as we go forward. Um, and I'll try to dig up some of the slash fencing um, information. And if I can find that slash carpet, I'll drop that into. If people's planted white pine or white spruce, they know that that's a deer candy. So those two species are deer candy. So you got to protect those, certainly. Any more questions, Lauren? 
Uh, there's one more that popped up. Um, per this person says, perhaps a more pointed question for follow-up. Can you comment on what pressures keep black locusts in check to the southeast and whether or not those pressures will also move here with the shifting hardiness zones? Is there something that we as eco-restoration practitioners can facilitate or situations where total elimination of black lo locusts from a site is not possible? That's a really good question. And Angie, you are the invasive species expert. So I'm going to pitch that to you again. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> so, um, so we, I have to tell you, I am very, um, torn about black locust. So black locust is native to the Eastern deciduous hardwood forest. So it is native to a, a forest that have a similar composition of, of trees that we have in Southeastern Minnesota. Uh, depending on what source you look at, it could be native in, in Minnesota. So if you look at USDA plants, uh, it looks like black locust is native in all of the uh, lower 48 or almost all of it. Um, but I looked this up just yesterday. So black locust is regulated in a number of states and it is a common example of uh, a neo- uh, what is it called? Neo-native species. So a uh, native that uh, that's a term that's sort of being replied to um, rage expansion species. I think you can make a solid argument that this is a native moving. It's a climate resilient species. So it, it um, and as a result, it's moving. But in those new ecosystems, it is showing signs of sign significant aggression, um, which a lot of invasive species folks would argue then is a definition of invasive. So it's not native and it's causing economic, ecological, human health harm. Um, it is very hard to manage and it is, um, it is a clonal species. It's a nitrogen fixing species. So it, it spreads by clones. And so that means it will spread into open areas very, very easily. It fixes nitrogen. So it changes the soil characteristics. So these are the things that cause a lot of people great pause. I will also say, um, and, and in its native range, it is not necessarily beloved, right? I mean, it, it, it is a bit of a challenge in its native range. I kind of, the analogy I use is that it's a bit like aspen in a prairie, right? So if you're managing a prairie, any tree is a problem and aspen clonally spreads, it tends to spread a lot. You have to actively manage it or the, you know, the prairie may indeed convert to aspen forest. I think it's maybe similar in the East. They don't, I think, manage prairie like we do. So it's a smidge different, but it's not beloved. Um, it is a great pollinator species. It blooms very early. It has, you know, nitrogen fixing benefits. It's got some forage benefits. It is also hazardous to some um, um, animals. So it, it's it's a mixed bag. But fundamentally, in the state of Minnesota today, it is regulated as a noxious weed, and you cannot import, plant, um, or knowingly move. So to abide by state law, we we did not recommend it, although it does model out to be fairly climate resistant. So maybe that answered the question. Um, I, I gave it a go. You're welcome to email me later. I do have a lot of opinions about Black Locust. <laughs> Thanks, Angie. You can uh, certainly email our team uh, there that the last couple of slides uh, Anna showed. Anna, you did an excellent job. I love it. I love this topic. Uh, I helped with the project, but it's a, it's a great project. I actually was at the Shade Tree Short Course and gave uh, two lessons and packed houses and everybody was interested in planting different trees. So uh, that was maybe more of an urban crowd but uh, very interesting. So there you see Anna's uh, email address. Certainly can email her if you have further questions. Thank you again for today's presentation, Anna. Appreciate it. Thank uh, you. Also, we have a couple more uh, Fridays with a Fort uh, with a Forester, uh, Emerald Ashmore, and also ticks in Minnesota uh, and, and uh, mosquitoes in Minnesota coming up. And uh, so certainly you can uh, access our, our, our websites there. Uh, as you leave today, there'll be evaluation. So as you close Zoom, uh, please fill out the evaluation. It's anonymous, but we'd like your correspondence. And, and uh, if you want some correspondence, you can put your email in one of the uh, questions there. Also, uh, share your comments about today's webinar and maybe future webinars. Again, all of our recordings for Fridays with a Forester are recorded on a Z-link, z.umn.edu slash Fridays. And if, you wanna, uh, if you're want to, if you not participatory uh, or getting the My Minnesota Woods um, newsletter, certainly you can access that information there with the Z-link there. Uh, we thank you for joining us to, for today's webinar, Fridays with a Forester. Again, thank you, Anna, and our forestry team, Lauren and uh, Charlie and Emily, and also Angie. Thank you for uh, joining us today.